Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of Knocked Conscious with Mark Poles. Today I had a great conversation with Jeff Hester who's famously known for taking the first ever image on the Hubble Space Telescope as well as probably its most popular image uh, titled The Pillars of Creation. Um, this was a very long conversation. We got caught in a time warp and it turned out to be about three and a half hours long. So what I decided to do is cut this into two parts. So we're, I'm going to present the first half right now and I will be presenting the second half next Tuesday, May 4th. Uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation. It was really enlightening and here it is. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Knocked Conscious. I have with me today, my special guest, Jeff Hester. Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, Mark. It is a pleasure to be here, and thanks for having me on. Um, a little bit about myself. I, or a lot. Or a lot, <laughs> as the case may be. Yeah. <laughs> Put a quarter in the slot and see if we get the long play version. Uh, by training, I am an astrophysicist, and that's what I did for most of my career. Um I was a professor at ASU for about 20 years. Before that, I was at Caltech, and I did a, a lot of work with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, I was a member of the team that built the first camera that flew on Hubble, a thing called the Wide Field Planetary Camera, um, which was the camera that was supposed to take all of the spectacular pictures and tell us how old the universe was and, and do all of that cool stuff. But for it, it's kind of interesting. A lot of people don't remember that when Hubble flew, uh, the images that it made just really were not very good at all. I remember them being a little fuzzy. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. A and I remember, I mean, I remember I was yeah. a little younger, so I was growing up with Hubble. So it was it was, it was such an amazing thing to me that that was happening. It was a little fuzzy, kind of in the same way that the Pope is a little Catholic. <laughs> yeah, I I actually I I have the dubious distinction of being the guy that was sitting in front of a computer terminal when the very first image from Hubble came down. Um, it's kind of a long story, but it it. There was a whole show. I mean, the NASA Select TV cameras were over my shoulder, and it was going out to the world live. And Jim Westfall, who was the principal investigator on the, the WIFPIC, was kind of standing over my shoulder talking while I... The, this was back before networks were what they are now. Right. And so they they wrote the data to a nine track tape and they brought it in and we made a show of loading up the tape and downloading this image. And then I pulled it up on the screen. And what we were supposed to do was to put a ground based image up next to the Hubble image. And the Hubble image was supposed to be spectacular and the ground based image was supposed to be not so hot. And it popped up, and at first it didn't look like there was anything there. <laughs> I was saying, well, that's strange. <laughs> and so I started digging deeper and deeper, and finally some things started showing up. And the things that showed up uh, didn't look remarkably better than the ground-based images. And so, uh, you know, for those, it, if you have ever run across the very first publicly released image from the Hubble Space Telescope. That is an image that I made sitting there in real time on national television as we were just kind of scratching our heads and wondering <laughs> what the heck was going on with this thing. So that was that was kind of where it started. I'd, I'd been working on it for a while at that point. Now, with the uh, Pillars of Creation, you're, cre you're also credited with that picture right oh yeah i mean there's a the if if you like we can go back maybe a little later and talk about the story of what happened with hubble in the first place because sure it is yeah a, it is a it is a very interesting story but the long and the short of it is that not long after uh it was discovered that 
the Hubble mirror. The yeah, yeah. Hey, our camera worked great. Okay, everybody, <laughs> our camera worked great. The problem was that the telescope itself had a uh, a flawed mirror, but it was it was perfectly flawed. That is the 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 mirror itself was an extremely high quality mirror. It was just the wrong shape. But what okay. that meant was that once you, you characterized what the error was, it was possible to build instruments that had the same error, but with the other sign. You know, it, it's a little bit like saying, you know, I have, I, I have very good eyes, although I am, I'm actually farsighted a bit. But what that means is that when I wear glasses, the glasses have the inverse problem that my eyes do. Right. And so you put it together and you get good images. Yeah, you get your sine and cosine, right? And they cancel you each get other out. You, yeah, yeah, your sine and cosine, or in, or in this case, a, a few of your Zernike polynomials. But anyway. <laughs> Perfect. Exactly. Zernike polynomials, of course. Zernike <laughs> polynomial. Oh, don't get me going there. And where was I? Where, I, where was I my will, head at that? At that I, will, I will head off in the direction of the kinds of operators that produce complete orthonormal basis sets <laughs> with real I. And that's all you want to know about that. So I'll shut up. <laughs> Anyway, well welcome. well, welcome for sure. Oh, I yes, yes, you're <laughs> you're you're very welcome. But the um, the long and the short of it is that the mirror was fantastic. It was just a matter of building instruments that could make good images with the mirror as flown. And so, shortly after the problem was discovered, I joined the team that was responsible for the Wide Field Planetary Camera Two which was very, very similar to the first camera, except it had the, uh, the corrective optics incorporated in it. And so we built that, and then it flew, and astronauts installed it on the, the telescope, which was I, the night that they installed the WIFPIC, I was actually down in the operational center at Goddard, and my if I job, remember correctly, didn't didn't wasn't that the arm capturing the Hubble? Wasn't that one of those repairs? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I think the, I remember following that. It was you know. it was the first servicing mission, and it was it was an absolutely extraordinary. They had more stuff to do than anybody believed for an instant they would actually get done, and they did every last bit of it. That's and amazing. So it was. But the night that they actually put the WIFPIC 2 in, I was down in the operational center, and my job was to look at the very first little bit of electronic data that came back from the camera and be sure that it was working, because if it hadn't been, they could have pulled it out and put the other one back in. So I was down there, and, and I was working on the data literally in real time they put it in and we started getting data back as the astronauts are still there crawling around and doing everything that they're doing and of course it's on multiple screens and i'm hearing the the conver ground conversation and all of this kind of stuff and i stopped in the middle of it and i had the presence of mind to kind of stop for a second and say this is as close as i am likely to get to to being in a science fiction film you know it just it just kind of had that kind of a feel to it but anyway hair, you hair know stood the, up i mean it, you know, <laughs> was it one of those moments it was it was headed off in the direction of being one of those moments it really was it i was, mean i get emotional yeah. when when the curiosity lands and when you know when there's success i yes. love when there's triumph because those obstacles that everyone has to overcome with, I mean, yes, you can factor everything in in a vacuum with calculations, but the real world yeah. throws curveballs left yeah. and right. Yeah. And yeah, with Hubble, we had the opportunity to go up and astronauts could go up and actually lay hands on it. So there was a way to fix it. Man, when you're, when you're sending something to Mars or you're doing something like that, um, yeah, there have been plenty of missions where somebody have said, you know, if you would give me five minutes with a screwdriver, I could fix this thing. 
Uh, but you don't get five minutes with a screwdriver on the, on those kinds of missions. Yeah. But anyway, and, yeah. And, the, and the Voyager's still flying. I mean, <laughs> technically, right? Like, it's crazy. How oh, man, technically images, nothing. They're still, you getting, know, they're still getting information I mean, back. The engineering them. is incredible. Yeah, yeah. The engineering is incredible. You know, these things, the Voyagers have now become interstellar travelers. They have actually gone beyond the immediate influence of the sun on on our surroundings. Um, yeah, which is really kind of amazing. But yeah, you ask about the the pillars of creation. I did not make up that name, by the way. Um, but it's, it's I, an I love image. the godlike of it. And there was something about oh. something that there was an image, you know, the Rorschach picture, right? Like looking oh, at God. a cloud. Of, yes. There's an, an image of a face and everyone attributed to you taking a picture of Jesus Christ. I believe. Yes. <laughs> and I did. I did an interview right after that thing went out that um, I did a, a live interview on CNN. And, you know, before God, what was the guy's name? Was it Miles O'Brien that was anyway? I could have been. Yeah, I think it I think it probably was. And before the actual telecast, we had a really interesting, sharp guy, great conversation about the science that got me in front of the camera. And the very first question out of his mouth cold was, I understand that people say you've taken a picture of the face of Jesus. <laughs> and it's like, oh, well. Thank you very much. <laughs> that guy buttered so, you up and warmed you up and just, yeah. was all just kind of massaging you and yeah, then just slapped yeah. you across the face. As I recall, my comeback was it, it looks more like Jerry Garcia to me. But. It did look a little fuzzy. I looked a little too much, <laughs> a little unkempt for yeah. sure. But that was a, that was a fun picture because it was, it, it came out at just about the time that people were starting to believe that Hubble was actually back and doing the stuff that it was meant to do. And it was this picture that you could almost, it looked kind of organic. You could almost believe that it was, you know, coral Alive. heads growing. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it had a story to tell that if you could go back four and a half billion years ago, there's good reason to believe that our sun and solar system formed in that kind of an environment. So it was kind of a science story that that Aunt Martha could wrap her head around, <laughs> and so yeah, it was uh, it was it was a great fun thing. And what really made it a great fun thing for me was it was a great fun thing that was taken with an instrument that I had been very close to actually, you know, I had been part of the process of making that instrument work. So it was, it felt good to me because it was end to end involvement from being there from the original crisis. Boy, you talk about a roller coaster ride. Yeah. So if, if I may, how, how many percentage of the, of the original people stayed on for that second tour like you did? Um, Maybe a handful or? It was, it was a separate science team. Now there were people. Okay, on the on the WIFPIC two science team, there were a, I, I guess three of us who had been associated with the first wide field planetary camera. Okay, on that team, um, but you know everybody else was everybody else. It was a new group, so I think that a lot of the people who had been part of the first one didn't have the heart to dive in and, and do it again. I know there were another couple of people from that team that were asked if they would like to be a part of the, the second one. And they said, no, I, this thing has swallowed enough of my life and there's really no guarantee that this is going to work and I got other things to do. Yeah. And I can't, I can't blame them, but, uh, but yeah, yeah it's, it look, was, that's what's great was, about the choice, right? You can yeah, you can choose you yeah. can choose your path, yeah. and you just must accept you know what ends up happening from that choice, right? Absolutely. And this was, you know, this was a this was a, a riches to rags to riches story. If if ever there were one, um, you know, I say it was I I 
have I have the honor of spending a bunch of my career sitting with a front row seat to what is clearly one of the most amazing stories in science in in a very long time. And, you know, it, that's being in the right place at the right time. But it was it was quite a ride. Yeah, it's also taking your opportunity when you can. And you took True. both ends of that. So True. kudos to that for sure. So after taking a picture of Christ, <laughs> we're, we're now we're now in 2021. Uh, it's it's April 25th, 2021. And I just saw an article that only 47% of people in, in America, in the United States, have some kind of religious affiliation to a synagogue, church, or mosque, or anything. Right. So I remember I met you, I believe, a couple years ago prior to this whole COVID thing, which I'm sure right. we'll talk about later. And it was, you were going to, you had a, a debate with William Lane Craig, Wayne yes. Lane Craig, Craig Lane, about, about you know, it was a theist, theistic uh, debate. Right. Right. So let's talk a little bit about theology. Uh, okay. I know it's, it always, it's always crossed your mind. And you always think about it. I, I think about it constantly uh, as well, because, it, you know, it does boggle the mind for sure. You know, it's, it's interesting. I was raised, I, I was raised in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. Um, you know, Oklahoma is a great place to be from with a strong emphasis on from. Um, sorry about that to my Oki friends back there. Right. You know what? It's a great foundation. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so, you know, my father was, was fundamentalist, one of the, the early followers of the 700 club and, you know, brother Limbaugh and all of that kind of stuff. And that was the world I was raised in. And I... When I was a kid, I was very heavily into that. Um, you know, when I was 14 years old, I wanted more than anything to feel the touch of the Holy Spirit and such things. Uh, but at the same time, I already knew that science was the direction I was headed in. That's just, that's what fascinated me. That's the, the direction that my brain went. And there were a bunch of us one night that were out camping camping in, for those who know Oklahoma, we were camping at Red Rock Canyon, which is out in the western part of the state. And we were doing what kids do at that age, you know, sitting out by the campfire, you know, talking about all those grand questions like why God allows there to be evil and so on and so forth. And a friend of mine said, you know, the whole thing might make more sense if there were no God. And I was appalled. I, I think it was the first time I had ever even heard the suggestion. And, you know, I just, oh, why are you going to hell? All of this kind of stuff. And even broke off the friendship for a while. Yeah. How did such radical ideas break their way to Oklahoma? Yeah, indeed. <laughs> but being who I was, the place that my brain took it was to say that, okay, surely you have to have God to make sense of the world. And so I started intentionally looking at events, looking at just how things were and asking myself, okay, does this make more sense if there is a God or does this make more sense if there is not a God? So, you know, kind of, kind of theism and atheism as, as competing hypotheses. And within about six months, I was a devout atheist. <laughs> you know, it's once you... Once you actually open your mind to it and set aside the things that you were raised to believe and instead say, I'm just going to follow the evidence and see where it takes it. Um, my experience was that it didn't take very long to get to the point that you just say no, that, that the, the notion of God is a notion that I, we can... It's an interesting subject why it is that we believe in God, and I we could talk about that. There is a a better and better neuroscience of okay, where is it that notions of deities come from? Yeah, and there's, I mean, I I've read some of the Jordan Peterson stuff on the hierarchy, right? Even from the genetics of like lobsters, for example. Yeah, 
Yeah. Where well, I mean, it, that, yeah. you know, we have this belief in a hierarchy and how, of course, you need, we want, we have this inexplicable curiosity to explain, you know, we want to explain things. We need an explanation and we have a hierarchical belief. So it makes sense that out of that comes this entity. Well, so, and so there's, there's even more than that. It's, um, you know, we are, we are evolved creatures. And the thing about evolution is that evolution, there are no evolutionary pressures wanting us, wanting our perception of the world to be correct. The evolutionary pressures that we were under were pressures to be adaptive. That is, they were pressures to keep to, ourselves alive. To fit in. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's there's to fit in. There's the tribalism. But there are other things as well. For there example, certainly are. Yeah. yeah. One of them, for example, is we have what some call a uh, a hyperactive agency detector is the kind of funky term they use to talk about it. What it boils down to is that that we have an evolved tendency to see agency to see to see life to see intention where none exists and that's a that's a perfectly reasonable thing. Dogs have. Uh, an agency detector. You know, you're sitting there, your dog's beside you, and there's a storm outside, and it blows a tree limb up against the side of the house, and your dog just goes crazy barking. Well, the reason your dog went crazy barking is because your dog thinks that there's somebody outside who's coming to get you. Yeah. Now, that perception is wrong, but there's no cost for that. Right, because it's, hand, it's that subconscious reaction yeah, yeah. that is could be potentially life saving, exactly. but the act does not is not a risk. It's exactly. it's just an all reward type action. Exactly, and so we have a, a hyper hyperactive agency detection, and I, you know, I could I could go on down the list of of. Of, of ways that our brains naturally work that don't tell us the way the world really is, but are adaptive, that when you put them together, it's like, yeah, of, of course we invented gods. How could we not invent gods? When, when you imagine that everything around you has agency and when you when you get to the point that you can think about other people and understand that, okay, they have consciousness too. When you can, when you can start to think in hypothetical ways, um, when you, when you are in groups and everything, your survival depends upon your allegiance to the group that you're in and so things that cause tighter bonding among groups are strongly selected for. And, you know, the idea that, okay, to go against my group is to go against God is, is a huge reinforcement for the notion that you're going to stick with your group. Um, and, and you go through all of that stuff and say, again, of course we invented deities. How could we not invent deities? Yeah, it's interesting because I always look at it. Initially, it made sense in the mind to try to explain things like thunder, lightning, you know, things yeah. we couldn't explain. Yeah. Uh, seasons and weather phenomena, for example. Yeah. Okay, one thing. However, it felt like after that, when the birth of religion came is when man took it and, and manipulated it for their power their, <laughs> and their yeah. growth of, of, of power. And it's no longer even what it initially was intended to be. Well, ag again, um, yeah, evolution is an extraordinary algorithm. And that's the way to think about evolution. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's impressive. You know, the, the idea that, look, the things that succeed survive and the things that don't succeed don't. And then you get those modified and mix them together and, and do that over and over again. And, you know, engineering, for example, more and more engineering is done using genetic algorithms, evolutionary algorithms. And so what people don't know, for example is that when they pick up their cell phone and use the network, 
the network that they're using was actually designed using <laughs> evolutionary algorithms. The same, the, the blades in jet turbines tend to be designed by evolutionary algorithms these days. And it just goes on and on and on. That's, and that would be for maximum efficiency, right? For yeah. airflow and whatnot like, yeah. in that respect, right? Exactly. It, it's amazing. Some of these algorithms that have been created. I mean, yeah, yeah. But what it, what it boils down to is when you think about humans, we are the process, we are the product of that. But it's not just humans. The, the religions that persist today are the religions that have been honed over thousands of years by the algorithm of evolution to be especially successful, especially good at pulling people in, especially good at, at um, having people hang on to religious notions even when the evidence says they shouldn't especially good at at bringing religion into the 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 tribe in a way that makes it very very difficult to to part with and so the re, the you know it's it's obvious the 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 religions that we have today are religions that have been very finely tuned made very resilient by the process of evolution over millennia makes makes some sense to me for sure yeah i you know you go back and in fact it's it's interesting i don't know if if you have ever dug into the early christian history kind of the 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 tension between the hierarchical forms, as you were talking about, the hierarchical forms of Christianity and the Gnostics. And that was just a matter of, you know, the Gnostics were doing what it was that they were doing, but as compared with the folk doing the hierarchical thing, you know, they just right. couldn't compete. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we would. I mean, I would say part of the Jewish religion is very family ba handed down, family to family. It's not like there's like recruiting, right? It's one of the one of the few major religions that doesn't really recruit, where Christianity has active, you know, missions and and there's a recruitment process. Yeah, but there was there was no need in Judaism. No, not at all, because it they're... worked in its in its own tribe or yeah. in its group. Yeah, Judaism started out as a tribe. Yeah. And, you know, Christianity had to build its tribe. So, so anyway, um, you know, yeah, I, I think another, another interesting thing, and this is the thing that I think about. In fact, I, I have in mind writing a book about this. You know, we hear about the scientific revolution and you think about Galileo and, and Newton and Copernicus and those folks. And you say that was the scientific revolution. Well, actually, no, it wasn't. That was the beginning of the scientific revolution. And it did, you know, it kind of said, hey, there's, there's this, there are these patterns in nature and it's not all just, you know, God imagining this is how it was supposed to be, but rather you can understand these patterns and that's how things work. And then along comes Newton and, and opens up that part of the world. And along come, you know, the, the folk like Boltzmann who started figuring out about thermodynamics and such as that. And along comes Darwin who, you know, the insight, understanding evolution is is one of the two or three greatest ideas, most profound ideas that humans have ever had. I, you know, I would absolutely agree with that, 100%. And, and on and on. And you go through all of that, and today what's going on, um, you know, this is, this is just me, but I think that we are right now in the midst of a revolution in our understanding of ourselves, of, of brain and mind and consciousness that 
has the potential of making what happened in physics a hundred years ago, you know, kind of pale in comparison. And so if you, if you really look at it, the scientific revolution is a thing that's been going on now for a few centuries. Right. And, and it's just exponentially grown. I mean, and it has, you... it, it has just exponentially grown and we are alive at this extraordinary moment when modulo things like not knowing what most of the universe is made of, which is just fun. <laughs> that just is. But, but we are at a point where we can go back to, okay, here is the universe when it was a vanishingly small fraction, you know, 10 to the minus 32 seconds old or something like that. Follow it through to the universe that we find ourselves in today um, formation of, of galaxies, of stars, of planets, the evolution of life, where increasingly it, it's, you know, there, there are so many ways for life to emerge, it's not even funny. The evolution from there, um, reasons to think that the evolution of intelligence is a, uh, a forced move, um, the fact that octopuses are intelligent as they are, and yet we have not shared an ancestor with the octopus for hundreds of millions of years. Um, yeah, that's interesting, that, right? Intelligence yeah. can grow different ways. How many times has the eye evolved? Is it 16 or so? Uh, uh, it, 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 it's a number of many. times. I, yeah, I, so. I think, I think how, the number is more like 50. But it's, well, How many it's times a, do we skin a cat, right? I mean, yeah. uh, how many ways yeah. can we skin a cat? Yeah. And that's a case where you look at it and it's like, yeah, okay, we understand how the eye evolves. You know, there's a, there is a, a sequence of events that gets you an eyeball where every step along the way improves your ability to survive. In fact, it's kind of fun. The, the octopus's eyeball is very similar to ours, except in our case, the the support structure, the you know the blood vessels, the all of that that feed the retina, mm -hmm. are on the outside of the retina, and yet in the octopus they are on the backside of the retina, That's which means that when our eye started to evolve, it was because a flat light sensitive surface started to curve in one direction, which once you start curving, you start getting directional information. Mm -hmm. And for the octopus, their first long ago ancestor that started to evolve an eye, that surface curved in the other direction. Interesting. And you just start with that tiny little change and you wind up with things that are, are, structures that are remarkably similar because right because thing, whichever direction it would have curved it still would have given that magnification advantage or that depth advantage right exactly in some way so exactly. it would have continued yeah. it would have continued that as as it improved because it knew it as an advantage yeah yeah or knew so, it i mean it's so weird evolution yeah, knows yeah, right yeah it's so it's anyway we put a consciousness on it right so anyway we are we are here today now having not only said, hey, there's such a thing as physical law, but having a deep understanding of the, the history of the universe, um, the, the formation of structure, the, the rise of life, the evolution of ourselves and intelligence, um, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And so here we are today and you look back to you know coming out of out of the Middle Ages, and it's like okay, basically all of the pillars of the understanding of the world that were in place in the Middle Ages, our understanding of the nature of the world, our understanding of the nature of, of the heavens, our understanding of the nature of life, our understanding of the nature of ourselves that where we have wound up today has taken all of those concepts and just literally turned them on their heads. For and sure. yet we live in a time when the majority of people 
Um, you know, as, as you said at the first, things are evolving away from that. Thank goodness. Because if they don't, uh, <laughs> we're in trouble. But anyway, we are at a place now where you look at it and everything is different. And yet the majority of people still carry a worldview that is much closer to the view of the world and of themselves that existed coming out of the Middle Ages than, than exists now. And so it is not surprising. We, we hear a lot about the anti-science movements and the anti-science movements coming from those on a particular place on the political spectrum that tend also to be a particular place on the, uh, on the religious spectrum and tend to be exquisitely tribal and so on and so forth. It is no surprise that that group is becoming increasingly anti-science simply because where science is just completely undermines their view of the world. Right. And so when they, when they feel attacked, you know, it's not like scientists are after them. I'm, I, if we were on camera right now and glancing down, I'm wearing a, a t-shirt right now that says science is not a liberal conspiracy. <laughs> but again, it's, it is no surprise. And in a sense, they're right. You know, in a, in a certain sense, that the the religious fundamentalists are at least intellectually honest to the extent that they look at their beliefs, they look at what science is saying, and they say those things cannot both be true. They just can't. And then they double oh, down. No. Yeah. And then they double down and say, okay, yeah. what? what we believe then is it must be what is true. At least they're honest to say that these things are, are mutually inconsistent. They're just wrong about the one that they back. Right. You know, they just I get back that. the wrong horse. Yeah. Well, that's funny. Cause I, I grew up Lutheran. So I, I have a, you know, a spiritual religious, whatever background. Mm -hmm. And, yep. but uh, the thing, the thing to me that I, I will admit taking a step back you mentioned the tribalism there, you know, another term in a nice way would be the community, right? Churches were really great centers for community. Yeah. And I'll, feel, I'll be honest. I feel like some of that has fallen apart and we haven't replaced it with something healthy that keeps the community, but removes this invisible deity that created everything. I, and, I couldn't agree more. And I, I just don't know that answer. Cause that's like my, that's almost my, worldly search my glo that is my purpose is like how do we keep community and just judge out you know just uh shake put it through a little filter that little you know shaker and just shake out the the religious stuff i you know you, you know it's it's interesting there are certainly nods in that direction i um yeah the the unitarian universalist church is interesting now they they I have a I have a good friend. Well, I actually have a lot of friends who are. I think there's one in Scottsdale, like Arizona, that. right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, I think I think I may have been to a, 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 yeah. uh, one of the one of their um, you know whatever meetings. Yeah. Or... But I have I have a a very good friend who is the pastor at a Unitarian church in uh, Massachusetts, and is it Massachusetts or is it anyway? the Northeast. And um, she and I have great conversations. We disagree about a lot, but we have great conversations. But, you know, she says, hey, my my congregation is full of atheists and, you know, so on and so forth. But we, we share a humanism. We share a, a commitment to each other we share those kinds of things. The problem is, again, the, the religions that accomplish that so well are the religions that have evolved to be very, very good at that. And there has been no similar evolution of 
of groups that are not religious, uh, but offer the same kind of community and the same kind of support. And, you know, and we are, we are social creatures. You know, the, anybody who has heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where the first layer is you have to take care of physical existence, you know, finally self-actualization at the top. Um, increasingly, from a neuroscience standpoint, they say, no, that's just wrong that if you really look at what is core to humans, it is the need for social connection. It is the need for a tribe. Yeah. And that makes perfect sense because let's face it, when we were living on the savannah, you know, in groups. I of mean, when 50, we were muskrats, let's not kid ourselves. I mean, oh, yeah. We, pro- yeah. we probably had to huddle together for warmth even yeah. uh, and, and to, you know, feed together, attack, hunt together. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, it's, there's a, there's go ahead a, with the Savannah. I'm sorry. I apologize. Any, no, 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 <laughs> no. Um, you know, we can take it. Yeah. The, the, the deeper roots of, of what, what provided the seed kernels for the, the social existence that we have are fascinating questions. But anyway, it, the, the one thing that you could not afford to do was annoy your group enough for them to to shun you because if you were shunned by your group if you didn't have that connection then you weren't going to become anybody's ancestor because you were going to wind up as somebody's lunch yeah and do you think some of that split is because you can now be you know the outcast and still survive in this environment because you could make money and and feed yourself and clothe yourself? You know, we're, boy, you're asking a fascinating question there. What is it? I try. I try, Jeff. I I always try. (laughs) You you do a good job of it. (laughs) You know, what is it? What is it that makes, that begins to make that possible? It's been a long time coming. It's been a very long time coming. Um. Part of it is that there are groups where within that group you can find like minds. You know, there's a there's a reason why the vast majority of scientists are atheist, especially if you start talking about people like biologists who really deal with this or, um, you know, to a certain extent, cosmologists and folk like that. Um and so if you have a community that does not depend upon religious belief for the community to exist, then you can afford to reject such things. I think it's also a matter of there's a certain fraction of people who just find it easier. You know, we're talking about a couple of percent or so, which also makes sense. Yeah, because you mean, you mean uh, to have faith, for example. Well, I mean, no, I mean, when you're on the savannah, if you if you think about it, you've got a group of people, and, you know, you've got a tribe on the savannah, and there are kind of two things that you, you can't have if that tribe is going to survive. On the one hand, you can't have every time a challenge comes along, you know, 80% of the people in the tribe then starting to argue about what's the right thing to do. Because while they're sitting around arguing about what the right thing to do, either the leopard or the tribe next door, you know, just offs them all. And that's the end of that. And so you you can't have you, you have to have most of the tribe on board. On the other hand, if the tribe has no way to respond to novelty, then you're also going to. The, the tribe also is going to kick the bucket because it's going to run into situations that that it doesn't know what to do with, which means that you need to have some fraction of the population that is thinking in ways that challenge conventional wisdom. You know, people, people, yeah, the think abstract it, thinking, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I've, I've read some things genetically where, Neanderthals, I you know, once again, we're still very new into this whole thing, but Neanderthals had this ability to have this more abstract thought, which allowed for more of the expansion, even though the brain was smaller as a whole than the Homo sapien. Yeah, 
and and the interbreeding yeah. obviously a certain percentage of neanderthals in some yeah. humans and it tends to be people who have some uh interest you know cognitive advantages in yeah. some way yeah yeah it's it is it is just absolutely fascinating our our understanding you know again back to evolution as a as an algorithm um you know the 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 kinds of solutions that it has found are just extraordinary and one of those solutions you know the reason why we are sitting on top of the food chain as it were is that we were the ones who did several things. One thing that we did is we really started to recognize pattern in the world. We started to be able to think hypothetically. We developed extraordinarily strong social bonds. We developed language. And with language now, you could take knowledge and culture and so on and so forth and share it from generation to generation so people didn't have to just learn things afresh every time. It's probably why we are ahead of the octopus in that regard. But anyway, well, you... plus plus our ability to harness fire. It's kind of hard to do it in an ocean. Well, yeah, it is. It is kind of it's kind of <laughs> hard to be do honest. It in an Dol ocean. Dolphin dolphins are highly evolved as well. Yeah. From, oh, from yeah. They my, are. From my experience with them, and yeah, they just can't make fire. I mean, they, and they don't have opposable thumbs. I mean, there's a couple yeah. little things that really that's the biggest distinction. You know? Oh man, dolphins are. Are you a diver? <laughs> I am actually. Yeah, uh, I'm Patty certified. Yeah. I'm. Yeah, I. My wife and I have been avid divers, scuba divers for over thirty years, and um, one of my favorite dives we were diving off the the coast of the big island in hawaii kona and we went down and we had a pod of dolphins come and just hang out with us for the whole dive and god it was fun but they are just such extraordinary animals highly curious i mean they are they yeah. are humans in the water i mean it's yeah it's it's hard to argue that they're not in yeah. my opinion and yeah. obviously orcas are even you know that yeah. much more advanced right yeah it's cool though dolphins one of the things that we ought to talk a little bit about is is the way that we perceive the world that which is a a, a fascinating question i love um, it let's do it but one of the one of the cool things with dolphins um you know what a dolphin's skull is shaped like? You know, it, it kind of, it dips down and then goes out. And then it's the lobe on the front of a, of a dolphin is just this kind of lobe of soft tissue. Yeah. And it yeah. turns out that that soft tissue is dispersive to sound. Which means, what that means, you know, glass tends to be dispersive to light which is why you hold up a prism out of the right kind of glass and, right. and you get a rainbow. Well, in the case of dolphins, what happens, the, the organ that produces their click is actually down right in the, in the crook of their skull, buried down there beneath all of that, that soft material, dispersive material, which means that when they click, one frequency of sound goes forward. And then as you go further and further up, I think it's, I, I think it's the lower frequency sound that goes more forward. And then as you go higher and higher to a greater and greater tilt, then it's the, the higher and higher frequency sound that's going out, which means that a dolphin makes a click. And by the the frequency of the echo that they get back, they know where it is coming from in, in elevation, whether it's in front of them or whether it's above them. That's then just absolutely amazing. They get, they get um, in, the, in the, the perpendicular direction, they get information the same way we do with phase difference between the ears. So they can tell if it's off to the right or off to the left. Right, but they must be much more highly evolved because wa uh, sound travels through water faster because it's a tighter medium, correct? It is. So it, it must be more sensitive in that in that respect. 
Well, yeah, there are fun things there too. They don't have eardrums. It's kind of fun. Okay. You have interesting. The, the reason that we have eardrums is that there is a mismatch between the air and liquid. And our inner ears are filled with liquid. You know, our, right. our ears evolved for that. And so there has to be something there to, to couple the two so that vibrations in the air make it through. If you live underwater, you just have your ear open to the water and the sound waves come right on in and away you go. Anyway, yeah. so I'm the, just saying the brain must process it faster because we like if we swim underwater as a diver, right? Yeah. If someone clinks their tank, you don't know from what direction it's coming. No, you don't. Because it's so fast through the medium of water. Well, there is so a processor between, you know, in the yeah. brain must must be faster. There has been absolutely no evolutionary pressure for us to be able to tell direction by phase information underwater yeah. and so we can't <laughs> yeah since we, i think since we've come out of the water we haven't yeah. really gone back you know we've yeah. gone supposedly out gone back in and come back out yeah according to the like aquatic that. ape or something like that yeah aquatic ape like theory that. <laughs> I don't anyway know. please <laughs> Any, anyway so and the other thing that dolphins can do of course is they know they directly perceive distance in a way that we do not because you send out a single click and the timing to get the click back tells you distance. But they don't send out single clicks, they send out multiple clicks. And the change between one click and the next gives you direct perception of the three-dimensional motion of things in the water around you. Yeah, that is a moving picture, basically. Exactly. And so... You know, what's it like to be inside a dolphin's brain because they don't perceive the world primarily just through sight. They perceive a three-dimensional moving experience of the world. And that, yeah, like is, a that is their perception. Echo, sonar, whatever yeah. you want to call that yeah. you know, in, in that way. Yeah. That's amazing. And, and so... So what about our perception? What do we do? <laughs> oh, How are we perceiving the world? There is cool stuff going on right now. Um, if I were to if I were to send people off to watch a, a fun thing online, um, there's yeah, a guy... please uh, please email me the link and I'll I'll yeah, add it to the I'll, notes. I'll do that. Like. It's yeah, a, please. It's a TED talk, and I, he's done other things as well. But a guy named Anil Seth, Seth. S E T H. Yeah, I looked some of his. Yeah, I looked some of his up because you you sent me uh, some notes about constructed conscious perception, right? Yeah, yeah. So I literally just went on the internet browser, went looked that directly up, and Anil Seth came up. So yeah, I, I was yeah. going to look that up next. Yeah, he did a he did a TED talk. He's a very good communicator, and he did a TED talk that the title was something along the lines of of you hallucinate your conscious reality. And he really means it. There's, there is nothing in that statement that is intended as, as metaphor or hyperbole. Yeah, or, it's not clickbait. Here. It's not he, clickbait. Yeah, it's, it's literal. Yeah, that our brains, our brains are predictive, and they have to be. Um, imagine, imagine that your brain had to wait for information from the outside world to come in and to be processed and for you to then consciously say, okay, this is what's going on in the outside world. And then for you to finally act. Right. Like uh, you see a rustle in the bushes. Right. You assume to the point of the dog barking, you assume threat much more than you assume what do what is this oh what rustling what does that mean you but know, the, you go you go to that prediction of it could be a threat but the timing the timing of it is what's key right because sure. you know there is there's about we don't we don't realize it because our brains are very good at making the perception go away but there is about typically a third of a second between when something happens in the world and when we become consciously aware that it has happened in the world. A third of a second is a long yeah. time in nature. It's a long time. And I've also heard that in some cases, people can know your decision up to seven seconds before you yes. consciously make it. Yes. Yeah. 
people think of the consciousness as being the the executive. Yes, I'm making this conscious decision. No, what's happening is you already made the decision in, pre-consciously, and your conscious awareness just became aware of the decision you have made. It's unbelievable. And, I mean, it just seems yeah. seems very counterintuitive in its own right, but it happens. Yeah, clearly. but but everything. That's that's the point is that you go back to you know our our understanding of the nature of space and time was adaptive as long as things didn't move too fast or get too big or gravity too strong but when you go outside of that realm it turns out oh our our intuition about that is wrong our yes, intu- I mean the quantum world is is yeah. a- Completely counterintuitive. Completely counterintuitive. Well. Things as things as immediate as the notion of cause and effect. There are now desktop experiments, you know, quantum experiments that demonstrate situations where event A causes B and event B causes A. Yep. It's um, amazing. So I mean, our, our, our sense of causality is wrong. Our sense of scale is wrong. Our sense of the nature of life is wrong. And our sense of the nature of our own consciousness is wrong. There's a people who do this kind of stuff increasingly even talk about the illusion of self. That, that, the, that the notion of a single unified I is an adaptive notion, but doesn't actually reflect what's going on in your head at all. And so, again, if, if, if we had to wait for conscious processing to then act, then the, the leopard that had a predictive brain that that was able to act more quickly than that would eat us for lunch quite literally. And so all of the evolutionary pressure is on a brain that can react quickly. And by quickly, I mean more rapidly than any kind of, of reactive conscious processing. So the brain has to be proactive. Well, how does the brain do that? The way the brain does that is it is predictive. That is, we have a model in our heads of the world. And that model makes predictions about what kind of sensory, you know, what kind of data streams should be coming down various neurons that happen to be connected to various sense organs but it makes predictions about what it is expecting. And then it compares those predictions with the data that actually come in. And what heads back upstream isn't the raw data. What heads back upstream are the error signals. The differences. Were were my predictions about the world correct or were my predictions about the world incorrect? It kind of reminds me of the sense of smell because it doesn't smell. It change it senses the change in smell yeah right so it you have your blueprint of the world that you put out and that's the predictive that's that predictive model yeah and then anything outside of that triggers those little errors right yeah exactly and your perception of the world is not a direct perception of the world your conscious perception of the world is that model so so in, in the same way that, you know, I, I always, um, I always kind of laugh because, uh, oh God, what's the name of the stuff? Anyway, the, the form of DMT that uh, Arizona Sonora toads Oh, produce. ayahuasca? 5-MeO-DMT. Five, five yes, 5-MeO-DMT. Correct, yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't, it's, it is a controlled substance, and yet it keeps hopping into my backyard. And Interesting. We, and, and we have... And a, your address is... No, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, way, we're way the heck out east of town, and uh, yeah. Oh. In fact, just, just a few nights ago, there, there was a 
So, and every so often, our dog, one of our dogs, gets a hold of one of these toads. So our we okay. we have a dog who has taken some really <laughs> amazing trips. Although they're bad trips, because let's face it, a dog has no way. All the poor dog knows is that suddenly there are monsters coming out of the yeah, woodwork. I, I can't even imagine the processing of that. <laughs> But, um, but anyway, so, so we, ha we hallucinate the world just like we hallucinate when we are on, on, you know, psychotropic substances. Yeah. But the difference is that what we think of as perception of the world is constrained by whether the hallucinations make predictions that agree with incoming sensory information. And so our, what we think of as our immediate experience of the world, man, you know, I, I see it with my eyes. There it is. Right. Is, is actually not immediate perception. It is a hallucination based upon our model of the world that is constrained by the, the incoming sensory information, the incoming interoceptive information, which is, you know, signals coming in from what's going on in the rest of your body and, and so on and so forth. And what that means, though, is that the only things that you can include in that model are concepts that you have. Right. If, if I don't, it, have... it has to start with your database. Like you can't, it's right. like a map. It's like, it's like having maps, right? Yeah. On your, on your phone. Yeah. If it's not loaded with the most current street information, you're limited. You're limited. That's right. And so the, the, um, the, the, your ability to perceive the world is determined by the limitations of the concepts, the understandings that you have. And what that means is that everybody has a different perception of the world. You know, Absolutely. we can we can share the same objective space. You know, you go to a you go to a ball game back when such things happened, and there are seventy thousand people in the stands or something like that. You're all sharing the same objective space. No two of you are sharing the same experiential space. No two of you are actually sharing the same perceptions, the same, you know, conscious experience of what's going on, which is why you can have situations, and this is starting to drive people in the law absolutely nuts. It is understood that you can have situations where something happens and there are multiple eyewitnesses and those eyewitnesses all give accounts that are completely honest accounts. Nobody's lying. And, and completely contradictory. And those accounts are completely contradictory and, and none of them conform to what actually happened. You know, there are, there are some amazing experiments that have been done where they set up situations like this and then they have people report and then they show those people after the fact, here's the film of what happened. And what people tend to do is say, that didn't happen. That's not what happened. They trust their memories over the video of what happened, despite the fact that their memories are just wrong. Because our and memories that, are also constructed in that way. And, and let's do a callback then on the theology side, uh, written okay. in the Bible. How many, how many years after Jesus's I'll, I say alleged, I just have to, alleged death, mm -hmm. uh, was he actually first written about? It was about 30 years later. Yep. You're telling me these eyewitness accounts of these things 30 years later, and you're going to trust that memory at that time? Right. I mean, no, it's, it's pretty funny. It is. It is pretty funny, especially. Regardless of the truth. I mean, just, just yeah. trying to trust a memory yeah. it, it, 30 years later. Yeah. Anybody who has ever played a game of telephone. You know, where I whisper right. in your ear and you whisper in the next person's ear and they whisper and, and so on and so forth. And then you compare what comes out the other side should understand that 30 years of those kinds of stories being passed along is just not any kind of reliable record, especially when the people who started committing those records 
to writing. He started saying, okay, here's what happened. What they were trying to do was they, they had a product that they were trying to sell. Correct. Okay. Right. And so those it, it, it's Judaism 2.0 is what I call it. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically. So, so yeah. those were those were not any kind of historical record. Those were not any kind of a of a uh, anything. They were sales pamphlets. They were yeah. sales pitches. Yeah. Pure and Time simple. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the idea and again, the reason why people take it so seriously today is that the version of it that is around today has been through 2,000 years of evolution of the, the versions of that religion that managed to do best, that managed to bring the most people in, that managed to so on and so forth, are the ones that stuck around so that today... Or outnumbered or outbred or out, you yeah. know, conquered or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And what's interesting to that, to that extent, I love like, to me, any belief, like I, I've, I started these podcasts cause I, I wanted to have opinions, ideas, and thoughts mm -hmm. I, cause a belief then becomes concrete. So if you attack a belief, it almost feels like you're attacking the person. Oh, you are. And, and by having ideas and opinions, those are very open to a, to being, you know, to standing the test of, you know, objective criticism. And again, you go back, you go back to the evolutionary underpinnings of all of that. The brain wants certainty. The brain badly wants certainty. Uh, and it's uncomfortable to be uncertain for most people. Again, another thing that makes scientists different in some sense is that we tend to be much more comfortable with the idea of uncertainty than most people do, for better or worse. But the brain wants certainty. The brain, the brain, once it has concepts in place, it kind of refuses to change those, which again makes perfect sense. We, we evolved in a calorie-constrained world. So there are in energetic arguments. It takes a huge amount of energy to do the rewiring that is necessary to change fundamental beliefs. And your brain says, I'm doing fine. We're still alive. We've still got a tribe. And now you want me to change fundamental core concepts just because right. somebody says there's ev evidence I should. You want me to shake the rattle, you know, you want to rattle yeah, the cage for no yeah. reason, right? You, you know, forget that. Uh, my job is to keep you alive and I'm doing that. So who cares what's true? This is adaptive. Um, so there's there's that aspect of it. So there are other aspects the of it. On the science side, if I may, I, I, I watch a lot of astrophysics stuff yourself yeah. um a number of other people at asu that you know i don't want to drop any names or anything but just in general i've listened to a lot of people have many conversations about these things mm -hmm. and about science doing that double check yeah so i have a i do have a question because i think it kind of probably goes i wouldn't call it a pseudoscience but like in archaeology with egyptology for example there are some pieces of evidence mm -hmm. or some you know uh what would you say uh something, you know, something that actually compelling information mm -hmm. that contradicts a lot of those beliefs that they keep fighting. Mm -hmm. And I thought the science was to expose that it's wrong. I mean, that's the whole point is to expose what is wrong so we can figure out what is right. It's not to take it personally that it's wrong. Yeah. Well, so, again, the so how does that happen when we try to be scientists and be open about contradicting really honestly without ganging up on each other? <laughs> says, in a field who example. says scientists don't gang up on each other uh, it's true the, i'm sure the thing, the thing about scientists is, is scientists <laughs> are people just like everybody else scientists Absolutely. scientists suffered the same the difference is is that that science has a very different working definition of knowledge you know, for, for most people, I know means that I've looked for reasons to believe something and have found them. Right. You know, most most people, confirmation bias. Once you get an idea in your head, <laughs> you see the things that agree with that and you don't see the things that don't. 
and that reinforces those concepts and away you go. The those thing gosh about, darn echo chambers. Those I'll gosh tell you. darn echo chambers. The thing about science is that in science, I know means that I have worked as hard as I can to honestly show that an idea is incorrect and so far have failed. Right. Now, it, yeah, and, and that can change with more information. Sure, Absolutely. Sure. And in fact, uncertainty is an essential part of that. You know, you go back and, and you read people like Karl Popper, who sort of turned the world upside down a little bit when he wrote about this in the, the early 20th century. Um, that, that the thing that you cannot have if you want knowledge is certainty. Because once you say, I am 100% certain nothing could ever change my mind, what you have just said is that you care more about what you choose to believe to be true than you care about what really is true. Right. And so if I claim certainty, then I have given up any right whatsoever to say that, that I have any knowledge. That, that that's what science does, that science takes ideas. You know, you, you, in science, what happens is, is you have a neat idea and you run it up a flagpole and everybody shoots at it. And then you bring it back down and you see what's left. And so right. in, in the same way we talked about, okay, churches are things that have evolved and and the ones that are around today are the ones that have survived the kinds of pressures we were talking about you know we are here as as animals for the same reason when you look at scientific ideas when you look at real theories by which i mean statements that make many many hard predictions about the world and those predictions are correct you know, the, 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 a good theory is a theory that people have tried very, very hard over an extended period of time to show are wrong and have failed. Once you have an idea that has withstood that kind of scrutiny, then, you know, you start to say, all right, here's, here's an idea that I can hang my hat on. To the, ex to the extent that it is possible for me to know anything, that's something that I can claim to know. Um, and, and so the thing that makes scientific knowledge so strong is because science says the one thing you can't have is certainty. You know, the, the, the reason why scientific I think Heisenberg so, said something about that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it literally is the uncertainty principle. It, it lit yeah, literally oh, is no. the uncertainty principle. So, so anyway, it's, it is, and again, the brain loves certainty. We, man, we run home to certainty. There's a guy by the name of God, what's his first name? His last name is Burton. Robert Burton, I think it is, who wrote a, a very nice book that was titled Certainty or Uncertainty or something like that. He's a neuroscientist where he went through and he looked at the brain's need for certainty and actually made the argument that the feeling of certainty is essentially a perception that it has nothing whatsoever to do with what really is true in the world. It is a perception, and it is a very adaptive perception because it's a perception that lets us act. There are so many times when the, the worst possible thing for you to do is to not take action. Yes. And so when there are challenges... You know, when your when your amygdala gets gets triggered and you're off into to fight, flight, freeze, and all of those right. Every, of things. I was just gonna say everyone talked fight, fight, and flight, but they they never really mentioned freeze because yeah. that is the third option, and that's probably the least of the three that you really want to deal with. Depends on what you're doing. Well, for sure. I mean, for yeah. sure. For you sure. know, man, you're a you're a possum. You're not going to outrun that thing, but 
yeah, roll, over can, and maybe. roll over and play dead, then who knows? <laughs> who knows, right? Yeah. But, you know, anyway, um, you you put all of that together, the, the nature of conscious experience, the nature of perception, understanding the process of evolution, applying it both to who we are, our perceptions, our ideas about the world, organizations like, you know, the, the church's religion, the very notion of there being a God, so on and so forth. You take all of those things and put them together. Once you have internalized the kinds of concepts that we're talking about, then you look at it and it's like the the relationship between these things is just so extraordinarily clear. How can anybody miss it? Except if people don't have those concepts and if their worldview is, is so fundamentally rooted in concepts that are different than that. They can't see it. They can't see it. They can no more. You can, and, and, Boy, I hate to say it. Do you ever do you ever play the game? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna label myself a sadist right. here. You ever ever play the game a, of Ouija board? Not Ouija board. Oh, okay. <laughs> catching catching somebody in a situation where they are clearly holding two completely contrary views. Yes. And it's then, very easy actually. <laughs> Oh, we all do. You know, <laughs> we all we, we all, all do. do. Yes, but find it's just a, it's just consciously knowing that we all do that right. you do is is really right. where we're at. Right. But yeah, you have somebody like that, and then you start asking questions, and the questions that you ask are questions that bring them closer and closer and closer together, and then pay attention to their behavior because they what, freeze. Because the brain what, shut like resets. The brain shuts. That that what you are forcing them toward is cognitive dissonance. The brain hates cognitive dissonance. The brain is is going to resolve that cognitive dissonance somehow. And the way the vast majority of time that the brain resolves that that cognitive dissonance is it takes the thing that that matters most to it and doubles down. Which is why, you know, you're talking to somebody about something and the more evidence that you show them, the thing called the backfire effect, sometimes the more evidence that you show someone that, that they are wrong, um, the outcome of that is they just become more vehement in their commitment to what they believed in the first place because the brain has to resolve cognitive dissonance and there, as we were talking about earlier, you resolve cognitive dissonance in a way that you don't have to rewire your brain and you resolve cognitive dissonance in the way that, okay, I've been getting by in the world like this. And you resolve cognitive dissonance in the way that, that this lets me remain a member of my tribe and so on and so forth. And so it's kind of funny, a thing, a thing that I think makes, makes, I don't want to overgeneralize, but one of the things that that is often different for scientists is that our core concepts involve commitment to what really is true about the world. That that for us, that is a core value. And so for us, telling us to ignore what is really true of the world is a little bit like going out and finding a fundamentalist and saying, you know, ignore this interpretation of the Bible and this God stuff and soul stuff and all of that kind of stuff because it's not true. Um, we just yeah, pay, have, no, pay no mention to the man behind the curtain. Right? Pay no, pay no mention to the man behind the curtain. But scientists have that kind of a commitment to the idea of what actually is true in the world. 
Well, I've actually had a cognitive dissident experience. Uh, I, I work with an NLP therapist yep. in the Valley yep. and um, there was a challenge that I had that I, it literally came to that uh, point, that pinhead. And I, it like schism, it like froze. It just mm-hmm. clicked complete like reset. Yeah. And it was a, it was an odd experience. But the other thing too, if I may, I always, you know, I always look at other effects and concepts that come in. We also have Dunning Kruger playing, rearing its ugly head at times too, right? Oh, yeah. And a lot of people don't know what that is, but basically Dunning Kruger is where people don't even understand that they don't have the capacity to understand. Yeah. And it kind of what's that uh, snowballs into this really kind of, black hole and so to speak yeah it is it it is a really fascinating you know if if you don't know anything about something then it's really easy to imagine that you understand the whole thing and it's only after you know a fair bit that you get to the point that you can appreciate how much you don't know right and so if you look at it as as your knowledge about some question increases your certainty about your knowledge starts by going down and then starts to come back up again. Although quite often the person who knows nothing about a topic is far more certain about it than a person who actually has tremendous expertise because the person with great expertise understands, you know, this stuff is complicated. You know, there's there's stuff here that we don't know yet. This is, there are places where I could be wrong. And so here I am, you know, the, the world's expert on something um, with with good reason. And I am less confident of my knowledge of that than somebody says, but I did half an hour's research on the internet. And I think... Um, you know this this idea get me going on the press this idea that that, that equal time go, go away this oh. no not go away but please uh, sh- fire away fire, how about that fire, fire away, away is, is definitely you know this this notion that equal time means finding people on opposite sides of something And then imagining that both of those viewpoints are, okay, we're just going to let them both have their time and so on and so forth, is kind of ridiculous. Because you wind up with global warming, for example, where every, you know, finding a, a legitimate climate scientist who isn't into the pockets of big oil, who will say there is any doubt at all about you know, anthropogenic global warming and climate change and such things. They just don't exist because the, 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 the theory is straightforward. The evidence is compelling. You know, there's just yeah. no question. And then you, regardless of the cause or anything else, the earth has gone through changes. Oh no, it's not just, Therm- I'm not, no, I'm and it's not, not that, talking right? about that. I'm talking, I am talking about, about human caused global warming and climate right. change. Absolutely. That, okay. That is that is as about as well established as the idea that Earth revolves around the sun. Right. My point <laughs> is though, some people don't even acknowledge a change. Right. In, do you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I'm talking even on its base level, yeah. there's a change. Yeah. I we haven't even gotten to the cause. I'm I, you know, even regardless of that. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There, the evidence is very compelling. Yeah. And then you get Jim Enhoff who grabs a fistful of snow and carries it onto the Senate floor and says, oh, this snowball proves there's no such thing as global warming. And you just wonder if it's physically painful to be that stupid. It is it's so <laughs> funny that people conflate weather with climate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Weather and climate are actually that there's more snow is actually a, is a bigger indicator because of that variance or what, yeah. you know, it, it's so funny because you can, you have an answer for all of these people's just blind uh, allegiance to whatever label that they are uh, yeah. to that side that they're on. And, yeah. you know, we're, we're on those extremes now and we can't, why can't we all wade in the middle? Like the part of this show is to have a conversation because I can't take us, I, I can have an opinion coming in, but I can be absolutely changed mm-hmm. 
by any kind of compelling information. Which which says that that you are unlike the vast majority of people in that regard. And that's very unfortunate. And that's very unfortunate. Because, because everyone has a vote. So we need the vast majority to have free freedom of this curiosity, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Well, again, <laughs> I wish. you know, I wish it for everyone. You, you, you watch and somehow equal time means taking, taking some member of this vast group of people who have spent their lives studying climate. And, you know, there's just, complete consensus and then you pull somebody out of the hat over here that's that's <laughs> carrying the 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 big oil flag and you put them together and treat them as though they both have equally valid notions and they don't in fact it's right. kind of funny because if you pay attention you will see especially if you watch certain certain <laughs> news channels certain you, you sure. will see when you talk <laughs> about something like climate change, you will see different person, different scientists, different, you know, this whole suite of people come in. And then you will see the same two or three people who are there to say, oh, no, there's no climate change. The reason for that is that they could only find two or three people who will say that out loud. Right. And yet somehow those two or three people are supposed to have you know, opinions that are taken as seriously as, as everybody else's. But again, you go back to all of this and start talking about, okay, how do we perceive the world? Where do our concepts come from? What are their importance? How easy are they to change? And none of this stuff is surprising. You know, you look at the work that, that, a lot of what we're talking about here in a very practical sense goes back to people like Kahneman, Kahneman, blah, Kahneman and Tversky, who, you know, Kahneman won a Nobel Prize in economics for the work that showed up in his book, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. But the idea, you know, when I took, took economics way back when, they had this notion of, well, there is the rational consumer. There is the rational economic actor. And what the rational economic actor goes about doing is maximizing their utils, is what they used to call them. The, the utils? Utils, yes. The utility of things. It's ah, where that okay. From. The utils. The utils, I yes. Like so I have my utils, and I'm going to look at my utils, and I'm going to... And well, yet that has, you... that has nothing to do with how we actually make economic decisions. No, and actually, I did a four. I did four podcasts uh, on each part of a BBC documentary called "The Century of the Self." Yeah, and it was about Edward Bernays, who was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. Yeah, and how he manipulated us since the twenties, from freedom torches for women in smoking, yeah, to all the way through, you know, current current even politics now. Yeah, yeah, and it's amazing. It's amazing. Go back. I'll tell you another one that you should go and dig into, and that is what has happened. It, the the core folk who made climate denial a thing are literally the same individuals that managed to put off a realization that smoking is a bad thing for as long as they did. That if you look at the people who were involved in the American Tobacco Institute and all of the phony science and, and all of that kind of stuff, what they did to, to bring about similar rejection of climate change was exactly the same playbook. You know, there was the, the American Tobacco Institute these days, they're the what is it called? The Homeland Institute or some? I, forget. I, 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 I have no idea called. anymore. Yeah. But it's, it's the same people with exactly the same game plan and they run it and we fall victim. In fact, oh God, what's the name? There's a really good book. Merchants of, Merchants of Doubt. Merchants of Doubt. Okay. Merchants of Doubt is the name of uh, of a book that delves into this, and it's really yeah. Well, there there good. are two really interesting ones to me about poisoning with globally that you don't even think about or hear about anymore. Was I remember Neil deGrasse Tyson did a Cosmos, one of the newer yep. Cosmos, yep. when he relaunched it yep. about the lead 
from leaded gasoline yeah. that ended up in the ice caps and everything. Yeah. That was one. And then the second one about all the pesticides that all the indigenous people at the poles are mm-hmm. getting. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, heat expands, it evaporates, and then it can contracts higher up towards the poles yeah. where it stops doing that. And then it concentrates. The people don't even use the pesticides are falling victim. Yeah to the the caustic agents themselves and never had any impact or did anything directly with that. Yeah. Oh, the joys of externalities. Yeah. <laughs> right. You I know, mean, there, you, there you're into a fascinating question too. You know, you mentioned before about how can it be that you can have harsher winters some places um, and more snow despite global warming and, and, you know, that's, oh God, that's fun, fascinating stuff. I I actually, I write a a column when I get it in, I don't do it every month. I should, but I write a column for astronomy magazine, um, called, uh, for your consideration that I've written articles about climate change and I've written articles about the global circulation patterns that give rise to what we're talking about here, where, yeah, you know, what what happens very very briefly, and I just have to talk about it because the physics of it is so cool. What Please happens? Do. I I love I love this stuff. What so. what happens very very briefly is that direct sunlight near the equator. That's where you dump the energy. Not so direct sunlight up by the poles. You don't dump as much energy there. Energy will flow from from hotter regions to cooler regions. The way that happens on Earth is there's convection near the equator um, that that where air goes up and then moves poleward, and there are a couple of convection cells before you actually get to the pole. And and that the the difference between heating at the equator and heating at the poles is what drives that. And one of the consequences of that is that near the pole, traditionally, there is a, the thing that's called the polar vortex. It's, it's the, the boundary between two of these convective cells. It's, it's where the polar jet stream is. It, traditionally, that polar vortex has been a, a very tight, very well-defined thing, kind of like the wall of a hurricane that has a, a really low central pressure. And the right. reason it looks like it looks like an octagon, right? Yeah. Or a hexagon, a hexagon, I yeah. think, right? It's very tight. It's yeah. it's it's very well, tight. Well defined. Yeah. But global warming affects the poles more than it affects the the equator. And what that means is that there is less of a difference. And the fact that there is less of a difference, now it's like what happens when a hurricane's central pressure goes up. There's there's less of a difference to confine that central circulation and it becomes unstable and that's what happens with the the polar vortex because there is not as much of a difference in the heating at the equator than at the poles that that weakens the forces that constrain that polar circulation and the net effect of that is that it becomes easier to have these fingers things called slow-moving Rossby waves, if you want to know, that that bring cold polar air down um, far south. And it turns out these things are slow-moving, which is how you get these periods where the whole northeast U.S. is plunged into extremely cold weather for long periods of time. Ironically, though, at the same time that's going on in the Northeast, if you pay attention to Alaska, you'll find people talking about why is there no snow on the ground and how come I can walk around in a sweater? Because that same disturbance can bring, that's bringing the cold to the Northeast. Had pulled it from there or had has 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 pulled warmer... um, mid-latitude air up over Alaska and places like that and heated things up, which is why the permafrost is thawing more rapidly than they imagined it would, which is why the concerns about methane release from the permafrost are, are so great, because methane is a much more powerful 
greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide and yada 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 but it's you know what you know what el nino and la nina are right children <laughs> <laughs> yes right <laughs> Well, they're, I mean, they are part of a uh, basically a water cycle, right? A current with temperature changes, right? That come through every 12 years or well, technically, I, is that the technical term of one of them? It's Almania? more, it's, it's more common than that. Um, okay. But, but it is, a, what happens is there's a, uh, the Pacific, a band of the Pacific uh, in the, the not too, well, it, it's near the equator, a band in the Pacific that goes from South America across. Um, if it is a, a degree or so warmer on the eastern end of that band, then it changes circulations in ways that tend to bring severe storms to the west and you know all of this kind of stuff. You hear about El Nino years. La Nina is a matter of at the other end of that band. It's now a couple of degrees warmer. And so you've got this, this one little strip of ocean and a, a moderate change in the relative temperature between two sides of that modern band. Managed to just completely play havoc with the global climate, with, with global weather patterns. Now imagine what's going to happen if you start changing the, the, the thermal distribution of the entire planet by several degrees. I mean, you know, it, El Nino and La Nina kind of tickle the climate and it does what it does. Right. What we're talking about with global warming doesn't tickle the climate. What we're talking about with global warming is you know, just a really swift, hard kick in the backside. Yeah. You're getting called up on charges. Exactly. Yeah. You're, you're, I, I get you. yeah, you, it's, this isn't a misdemeanor. You're getting called up on serious charges at that point. That is not, that does not sound very happy. <laughs> not... We were having such a pleasant conversation. <laughs> was, yeah, I know. It was so nice. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, oh, no, no worries. Yeah. The, the, I love I love the conversation. So yeah. it, I go D. I I love give me a rabbit hole. I'll take the red yeah. pill all day. Yeah. Uh, I wish I didn't always feel like I wanted to, but yeah. I do. I can't help it. You know, I I have to say it as someone. I I find it very easy to really get wrapped up in stuff like this. I I care about stuff like this, and one of the ways that I kind of protect myself a bit. Because me getting too caught up in it doesn't help anything. One of the ways that I kind of protect myself is, okay, I bring the phys physicist in me out and say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at the cool physics. And man, when you, when you talk about climate change, the consequences of it for humanity have the potential to be devastating. I mean, humans evolved during a period of, of Earth's climate history when things, Very calm. things were Very extraordinarily calm. calm. Right. And we're certain. Now we're screwing that up and we're screwing that up in ways that, okay, you can't grow things where you thought you, you could and you can't get water where you thought you could. And temperatures in places that were inhabited become impossible to inhabit uh you know you pay attention this what the last however many years have been the, the however many hottest years in in history and here we are both in the phoenix area and <laughs> we're right eventually we hit 121 last year 121 we hit last year 121. We did hit a record yeah yeah so yeah um and and to that point i actually i i was fortunate to have a trip to belize last year right before covid oh, shut down early march yeah, yeah and um i was on one of the islands the Amburgus key i yeah, think and yeah. then we flew to the mainland and then i went to that uh santa Letita. it was one of the uh the mayan pyramids yeah. 
And we're driving through and there's this billow of smoke in the distance. And I'm like, what is that? And they're like, that's the rainforest. Uh-huh. They're they're burnt. It's a Burning sugar it. company in from Spain uh-huh. that or I believe it's Spain. I don't want to I don't want to dox anyone, but I believe it was a Spanish sugar company that was burning it clear for to make their sugar cane. Uh-huh. And, you know, I hear numbers like, is it 80 percent of our oxygen or 20 percent? Whatever. The uh-huh. number is astonishingly yeah. huge. Yeah. And it's to make sugar cane. Are you are you kidding me? Yeah. You, you can do something else. Yeah. <laughs> another you, another one to dive give us diabetes and take our air away that thank you another you know? another one to dive into like that is go do some digging into uh what has happened in borneo palm oil and a lot of that was driven by the the health craze in places like the united states Yes. Where, oh, you know, yeah, the, the higher burning point, right? The, higher burning the, temperature. The trans fats are all awful and so on and so forth. We've got to change. And so, yeah, we're going to change that. And it turns out palm oil, I think I'm telling this story, right? Palm oil is a better oil in that regard. And so suddenly there's huge pressure to to produce lots of palm oil. And so you wind up taking the the environment on Borneo and leveling it so that you can turn everything into, into palm, you know, palm plantations. Right. And in the process, you, you destroy vital habitat for all manner of, you know, I, I will, I just want to toss out there. Um, Whoever comes up with phrases in the in the environmental community needs to go take a PR lesson. Whoever came up with the phrase save the planet was an idiot. <laughs> because a million years from now, the planet's going to be here. There will be yeah. a thriving ecosystem. You know, the planet's going to be fine. The planet has survived worse. You know, the, the, the KT impact 66 million years ago that wiped out the dinosaurs and the vast majority mm-hmm. of life. On, you know, there have been these, these great extinction events. And, the, you know, the planet will survive it. The planet will be just fine. This is about save the people. This is about whether we survive. This is about whether our civilization survives. Um, it's kind of the same thing right now with whoever came up with the, the phrase Green New Deal. I just want to take out behind the woodshed and, you know, talk to him. I, I don't want to get political about that one because I just some of some of the phraseology. So it's the stuff that's attached to the intent, the good intention of a yeah, bill. Yeah. That really pisses me off. Yeah, no, it just does. It, it kills me. It does me. It does me, too. In this case, the Green New Deal. OK, it's all about being green and we don't like those tree huggers and so on. And so, well, actually, if you look at it, um, what you're talking about here is survival of the species. OK. And New Deal, New Deal sounds like, oh, this is a big welfare program, and that means it's going to cost lots of money and so on. Because so that was, was added to it. I think that's what was the draw. The, the thing is, though, is that if you look at it, um, the, the money that we spend on non-renewable energy is huge. The money yeah. that we spend on a military to protect our interests in the Middle East is huge. The, the, you know, and that's even setting aside like cli- things like climate impacts. The economic boon to a conversion away from fossil fuels to renewables. Can I ask you a question about that one? Because yeah. this, one, this one's killing me. I, I, I understand the electric, I, I want to call it fad right now, because I feel like the mining for the lithium <laughs> is also so detrimental to its to the environment where and where the mining takes place there's a lot of conflict there's a lot of licensing issues yeah uh to get those raw materials i i always thought it seemed like hydrogen seemed to be the least impactful future alternative choice you know i that's that is an interesting question and there are 
it's actually a thing that's different depending on the the scale that you're talking about. Batteries are the big deal for for cars. People are talking about batteries as the big deal for individual homes. But if you look at what's going on, if on on utility scale or even modest you know you you're talking about you've got a small community that decides to go solar on that scale you can do this too um regenerative regenerative flow fuel cells turn out to be extraordinarily more efficient they turn out to be extraordinarily more cost effective you know, this is a thing. Can you explain what that what those are or in yeah. in like a lay term? Yeah. Um, if you people might know about two things, people might know about two different kinds of electrolytic cells. One is where you put the two electrodes in water. You know, this is an experiment you do back when you're when you're in, in high school or something. Right. You you put the two electrodes in water and then oxygen bubbles up on one and hydrogen bubbles up on the other. Okay. So what you're, what you were doing in that particular case is you were putting energy in, in the form of electric current. And by doing so you're taking water and you're producing hydrogen and oxygen. Well, what happens if you burn that hydrogen and oxygen, you get air, energy back, right? But there's another kind of electrolytic cell, and people use them all the time to start the engine on their cars. It's just a battery. And what happens in the case of a battery is that now you have an electrolytic cell, but it's one where the, the electrodes are of different materials in a way where... Um, you know, you, well, okay, actually a battery is the whole thing we're talking about here, but where where charges migrating from one electrode to the other now gives right. you electric current. Right, exactly. Yeah. What one of these regenerative um, fuel cell things does is it's a situation where you have an electrolytic cell that can run both as a producing energy thing and as a storing energy thing. But what happens is, is you have a fluid that flows through. And as it flows through, if you are applying the voltage in one direction, you wind up producing energy. And if you're applying the voltage in the other direction, you wind up storing energy. And the Very energy is actually stored not in the electrodes. The energy is actually stored in the fluid. What that means is you can do this safely. Because if you take the few, you know, you, you've got now two liquids coming out of this. Right. If you store them away from each other, they can't do what a lithium battery can do. You know, they right. have no reaction that can release energy until they get together. And these things are one of the technologies that is is being looked at for storing on large scale or even modest scale. Um, there but are batteries others. are batteries are the mo are, are they the least environmentally impactful on a personal scale? That is just with the volume of cars that are out there and everything and and homes. Well, except. You, and please understand, I'm not, no, I'm not asking not. in doubt. I'm asking no. it out of pure curiosity. No. I, I, I understand that. Um, huge amounts of effort have gone into things like solar cells and batteries and so on and so forth. I know this stuff about batteries less than I know this stuff about solar cells. Solar cells, they're really moving in a direction where, where they are getting more and more efficient while at the same time relying less and less on the kinds of rare earths that you have to worry about. Where you have okay, so the, the materials be, is more synthetic and better. Yeah. 
so know? it's not it's not it's not taking like crystal or diamond or whatever you know whatever material from the earth right it's actually being manufactured yeah it's it is mo- or and the materials that you use oh God, i wish i'm forgetting the 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 specific terminology oh and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna try to remember it because i'll get no it wrong worries yeah else. and and obviously we're both in arizona we understand the the, the so <laughs> yeah. the solar panel yeah. and how much better they've gotten yeah it's it's it, i actually did the calculation the other day just for the heck of it and looked at where things are now and if oh this we should do another one of these things and just talk about solar energy because let's do it. You can, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll plan that. You can, you can run, run this one forever, but where things now, even with, with today's economics, it's already the case where if you amortize it out over the life of your solar electric system, that you win big with solar over what you're doing if you're if you're doing uh, uh, non-renewable energy sources, if you're using things like fossil fuels, you win big. The problem is, one of the, the reasons why not everybody puts them in is that over the last, I want to say over like the last six years, the the efficiency of the systems have you know, well more than doubled while the price has come down by some huge factor. And so there's this economic incentive. If this makes sense this year, then it'll make more sense next year. Right. Like waiting for a personal computer. Right. Prices yeah. come down. And so there is the way things are right now is it's the person. And there is a look of it, you know, I'll, I'll admit, but I've, I have a, somebody right. I'm looking at out my window right now. And there's somebody with one of those Tesla where it's the shingles. Yep. I mean, they look amazing. They you look can't, amazing. you cannot tell no. that, that, that there's any kind of solar component to that no. at all. I thought it was, I thought it was really funny. You know, the big Texas freeze this year, the number of people from Texas who were, were, investigating solar cells during that went up by something like a factor of 15 (laughs) because what was going on is, is everybody on the block is, you know, all the lights are off and they're freezing their keisters off and so on and so forth, except for that one darn house down the street that has the lights blazing and, you know, (laughs) no, that's Joel Osteen's place. He doesn't let anybody in. (laughs) <laughs> but you get the, you get the idea. Yeah, I, know, I, I know. mean that's just yes. We're gonna we're gonna have great competition, and we're gonna cut our grid off from the rest of the world so we can have freedom or whatever. And so what happens is we actually play pay more than a lot of other people do for our electricity, while at the same time having no power security. Right. Um, tell me, it's crazy, tell right? Me why this is a good deal? Yeah, uh, it's weird. I mean, look, look. Anyway. look. Yeah, you want to, I mean, you, we talk about control. I mean, debt, debt is the way that we are controlled. That's the number one way. Yeah. Number two is is our reliance on other, on uh, definitely natural u- utilities, yeah. natural monopolies, yeah. uh, uti- you know, energy being a key component yeah. to that. Once again, that was the first half of my conversation with Jeff Hester. Please follow, subscribe, rate and review us, knockedconscious.com. Uh, I also have the podcast Beer Google, so please uh, jump on there as well. Thank you again for joining us, and I will be presenting the second half of this conversation with Jeff Hester next Tuesday, May 4th. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.